Lisa the Joyful was a stretch goal for the initial Kickstarter of Lisa the Painful RPG. It was intended to be a DLC chapter that would continue the story directly from the ending of Lisa the Painful. Which if you haven't played through it yet, I'd recommend doing that before watching this review. Check out my review of Lisa the Painful if you're unsure about the game. I'm gonna try as humanly possible to be spoiler light at best in this review. but. This this is still a title that is spoiler laden from the opening scene, so keep that in mind. Lisa the Joyful is a story driven addendum to the Lisa trilogy that sets out to wrap up most of the loose ends within the universe. It's only $4.99 on the Steam store, and the best part about buying Lisa the Joyful is that the soundtrack is included for free. A welcome addition. No seriously, you need this soundtrack. Let's start off with the basics. You play as Buddy, aka the alleged last girl in Olathe. So what happened to Brad and the others? I'll leave it to you to find out. And trust me, you will find out within the first five minutes of the game. Buddy is on a mission to become the strongest person in Olathe and will stop at nothing to take out the leaders in charge of the various territories in the Wild West. For the most part, this is a solo mission for Buddy, which to be honest, makes the game far more challenging than the painful. Your preconceptions about the battle system in The Joyful are going to be wrong if you go in thinking it will be similar to Lisa the Painful. I made many mistakes in my first playthrough of The Joyful because I was unaware of the various new mechanics that I didn't know had changed. For example, Buddy is a sword fighter instead of a kung fu master like Brad was. So instead of delivering punching combinations, she relies on timed hit attacks in the vein of Lost Odyssey where you have to wait until a battle ring shrinks around a hit button and mash the attack button to use a special attack. Maybe it was my mistake and they mentioned it somewhere, but I was unaware of this mechanic until about halfway through the game when I began to wonder why all my specials were so weak. Trust me when I say you need to master these timed hits because your regular strike is weak. Also, a small reminder, do not turn on skip battle animations in the options or you will never be able to land the special attacks because when you skip the animation, it never forms the circle and Buddy automatically reverts to a very weak special attack. It kinda sucks. Maybe that's an oversight on Dingling's part or maybe it was intentional so he could force the player to get used to this new battle system. Regardless, it kind of slows down the gameplay, especially when you're waiting through enemy attacks. Buddy has a TP gauge that fills when she delivers hits or takes hits from enemies. She uses this TP to execute the special attacks. She has two basic specials, stronger sword strikes that have a chance at making the enemy bleed, which is very useful on some of the later bosses, or a flash move where Buddy flashes her chest at enemies, causing them to become flustered and skip a few turns. The flash move is very useful, especially if you need some turns to heal up. As I mentioned, for the most part, Buddy is fighting alone in the majority of the battles in the game. As a result, every turn in battle counts. There are no spots to grind like the caves in the painful, so mags and items are very scarce. This can make some of the later fights absolutely brutal, especially if you're attempting a joyless run like I was. If you're unaware, joy is essentially the meth of Olathe. When you take it in the game, it restores all your HP and gives you a massive 
massive strength boost, just like meth. The downside of using Joy is that you'll eventually turn into a mutant sometime later on, just like meth. In Lisa the Painful, you're rewarded with an achievement and an additional ending if you go joyless. So naturally, I attempted a joy-free run in the Joyful. I made it through about 80% of the Joyful before I was completely out of items and enemies were kicking my ass left and right and the only thing I had left in my inventory were joy pills. Well, it turns out the gameplay is designed around Buddy popping joy to survive. The game instantly goes from extremely difficult to a cakewalk the moment you pop joy. I won't elaborate further on the implications of this mechanic as far as the story is concerned, but I do want to warn all players out there about the issue this poses with the item merchant. During my joy-free attempt, I had figured that having joy in my inventory was pointless, so I decided to sell all my joy to the sole merchant in the game. I returned to the merchant later on, only to discover that he had turned into a joy mutant. Seriously, if you sell joy to the merchant, he will take them, you fight him, and then you can no longer buy items from him or sell your spares. Just a fair warning. So in this game, Buddy doesn't have a joy addiction per se, like Brad did in the previous incarnation, where Brad had to take joy occasionally so he could keep his stats in check. Instead, that is replaced with a sleeping mechanic, which encourages the player to sleep at campsites instead of paying for hotels, because there are no hotels in the game. Occasionally, buddy will get tired and then you rest at a campsite. The downside is there's still that random mechanic wherever you could get poison or have something stolen or you might even get a present. So there are some trade-offs for this system. One final warning. Whatever you do, do not attempt to fight Johnny Walrus and his friend. I spent an hour trying to kill him, only to find out that a bug gives him infinite HP. This may have been fixed by the time of this review, or they're working on a patch as we speak, but you're better off just skipping Johnny Walrus. He doesn't really give you anything special in the first place. Because of some of these glitches or oversights, it's evident that this game still needed some additional playtesting. That's just kind of a minor gripe on my end, but, but I would have liked to see some of these bugs ironed out or some of these mechanics explained a little bit more in the gameplay. Buddy is well aware of the danger she faces being the last girl on Earth, so she can find various masks to conceal her identity. At any point in the game, if Buddy is caught without a mask, NPCs will attack her, so it's important to wear one if you want to talk to anyone, otherwise you're going to end up fighting them. Outside of hiding her identity, the masks that Buddy can wear do little else than have an aesthetic appeal, which I feel is a missed opportunity. Opportunity. For example, Buddy can find a mask of Terry Hintz, a character in the universe. It makes her face look just like Terry, which is cool. I just wish it would have given her the ability to do some of the cheers or the awesome elbow drops that Terry could do. Giving the mask attributes of any kind would have made the lack of party members a bit more bearable and give the battle system some needed variety. There's no equipment to collect in the game, with the exception of a sock you can get when you sleep at a camp campfire, you're pretty much stuck with the same set throughout the game. I guess in a sense it's less to worry about, but it still feels like a step down mechanically from Lisa the Painful. There's a giant stone slab that acts as a list of targets Buddy is hunting in the wasteland. Some of the targets are easy to find and have signs pointing to their hideout and others require a bit more searching. If you're familiar with the previous game, then you'll know to pixel hunt every nook and cranny or occasionally jump off a cliff. Make sure you save before before you leap. After you kill a target, you'll be returned to the slab and little changes happen to the world thereafter. Traveling around the world is simplified this time as ding -ling programmed in a running mechanic by holding down the shift key. When running, Buddy can clear small gaps and she now has an ambush mechanic where if Buddy leaps off a ledge and lands on an enemy, she'll quickly slit their throat without going into battle. So this might just be me splitting hairs, but I found the levels of the Joyful to be much less inspired than 
its predecessor. If you were to ask me to name five areas from the painful, I could instantly name the horrifying McDonald's, the Mutant Resort, the Fish Village, Pre-Apocalypse Olathe, the Wrestling Arena, I could go on. The areas in the Joyful are ultimately empty and forgettable, with one exception. Seriously, I beat the game yesterday and I could only generically describe places like that cave with the arrows that shoot at you, or that cave with the four big guys you need to fight. I don't mean to diminish the work put into this game, as I understand this was intended just to be a short little expansion, but I was kind of disappointed that many of the areas were just reskins or just caves or empty areas. A little variety would have been nice. I'm gonna have a difficult time explaining the story without giving away major plot points. Let's just say that in the Lisa series, the story and the quirkiness of the characters is what made me a fan of the series. The joyful story has a different edge of its own. Not a bad one, just different. It isn't as isolating and disturbing as Lisa the First, and it's missing the humor and the ensemble cast of Lisa the Painful. I've mentioned before that I've read many fan theories regarding the implied storyline and the explicit details given throughout the Lisa series. In many ways, it feels as if Dingling was validating some fan theories by making some characters act out of character to their previous incarnations to fulfill the expectations of fans and to arrive at the conclusion in a quicker manner. I'd hate to tell an author what they should have done as it's ultimately their creation, but I kind of wish some of the implied story points from Lisa the Painful were left implied. Sometimes explicit information dumps take away the awe and mystique of the narrative. There was one character in particular that I had an issue with regarding their 180 person personality change. Without giving away names, you'll know who I'm talking about if you've played this one. This character went from a ruthless psychopath to a remorseful hero waxing poetic about how good of a person their arch nemesis was in the span of a couple of days. It also doesn't help that Buddy herself isn't likable in the least, so it's really hard to identify with her motivations for her actions. I'll leave it at that. There are also a few deus ex machina type interviews inventions in the plot that resolve some issues instead of having Buddy face a real consequence to her actions. Regardless, there are still some emotional and endearing moments in the game to be had, but for a game that's acting as a conclusion to a trilogy, it still leaves the player with some unresolved questions, especially near the end. Perhaps this was the intention to spur more conversations between players. Perhaps the joyful isn't the last in the Lisa series after all, and maybe Jorgensen will replicate Scott Cawthorn with his Five Nights at Freddy series and release additional chapters in the saga, keeping the mysteries alive and resolving very little to keep us wanting more? Well, if that was the intention with the Joyful, then mission accomplished. I'm left wanting more. For only five bucks, I'd still recommend it, even though the length is a bit on the short side. The soundtrack alone is worth it, and there are still some great moments moments to be had. Overall, I'm still left with the sinking feeling that this is not the last we will hear of the Lisa series. Only time will tell. Thanks for watching, and to new viewers out there, thanks for giving my little channel a shot. I'll see you next time.